right, so we're going to start talking about Yukawa interactions, but before we start talking about these Yukawa interactions, um, I want to talk about just a brief introduction to the Dirac Green's function, because this is where things kind of get a little bit complicated. Be and the reason they get, the, the only reason they get complicated is because there's a lot of indices that we are going to have to keep track of. So I want to provide a picture that will help us to understand a little bit better what exactly um, these, these components are going to look like and what, how exactly we can picture them or how they're just how I picture them, perhaps. So, we've talked about our... We've talked about these special functions. And these special functions, again, they're essentially Fourier transforms of these spike functions, or these direct delta functions. And in the case of the Klein-Gordon equation, they look like this. Um, that's to the fourth power. And we have B times minus I A mu X mu minus Y mu minus K mu X mu plus M squared. So this was for the Klein-Gordon case. For the Dirac case, they're going to look a little something like this. So they're special functions again, but we have components on them. These components Essentially, this is going to look the same. So what I could do is literally just copy paste this. So we'll go ahead and copy paste this. either. <laughs> and then my apologies for my dog making disgusting noises. Uh, oops. Oops. K row gamma rho plus m. So we have this extra term in here. We see these alpha betas. And this is going to be our Dirac um, Green's function. So this is our Green function. This is our greens function. So what we're seeing essentially is kind of the same thing. There's really only this, this added extra stuff right here. And this should actually be, there should actually be minus sign right there. And we get rid of that minus sign. Okay, so I don't, so, so here's the picture I want to provide. This video is probably going to be really short, by the way. I just, I want to do this bit by bit, not to overwhelm um, you guys. The longest videos I'll do, or hopefully will be 30 minutes. 
right? I, I've realized some of the videos I've done in the past have been over that, but I can, I, I might do videos as short as 10 minutes. The point here that I just want, the point I really just want to get across in this video is keeping track of our indices. What's going on here? So in the case of our scalar field, so here's a scalar field. So here's our scalar field. We, it looks like this. And I'll have a Dirac field over here. This Dirac field, so I'll just name Keep in mind, we haven't really talked quantum yet. These are still classical fields. Again, apologies for my dog. So we have these spikes in our field, as we've talked about, say at this point and at this point. And we have we can have spikes in our Dirac field too, right? These are our excitations in our Dirac field. And these excitations in our Dirac field are, um, again, given to us by phi, um, all right my apologies for that again my dogs are very annoying um but anyways what we were talking about is we're talking about these again we have these excitations in these fields these excitations in these fields interact with each other via these uh these um greens functions right and so the excitations themselves, well, what are they, right? Ma mathematically, when we're talking about the drag field, we're talking about spinners, right? And so these spinners have different components to them. And so that's what I have right here. And so right here is another spinner, say beta, okay? And right here, I in the Klein-Gordon case, I have really just um, phi 1, and I have another one, phi 2. Okay. Now, the way we talk about these interactions, like we've said in the Klein-Gordon case, is through the, the Green's function, right? The Green's function for the Klein-Gordon equation. And the, in this case, again, we don't have components, okay? So, but in the case for this, or in the case for our spinners, so I'll label one, one and the other two, when we're talking about interactions here, well, we need to take into consideration the interactions that are occurring between all the components, right? So for phi one alpha, this is really phi one, phi one, phi one, phi one, and and this is gonna be zero, one, two, three, and then phi two, beta, well, that's just going to be phi 2, phi 2, phi 2, and phi 2. Remember, these Dirac spinners are um, four-component objects, so alpha and beta are going to run through 1 and 4. Okay. Well, we need to talk about interactions between here and here this component and this component, this component and this component, this component and this component. 
We also need to talk about interactions between here, 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 and here. And likewise, like you can see there's a lot of interactions that take place. So what this ends up looking like is actually uh, our phi, our phi, our special function for our Dirac equation is going to be an, uh, a matrix. And that matrix, again, is going to tell us how each one of these are going to interact with one another. No, not four. We started it. So we actually have, so this Dirac equation, or the, this, these two Dirac spinners interact with by, via a matrix. And each matrix, or each element in the matrix, is a Green's function, right? Because here, right here, say our zero, or is it say this one, right? We have our one and our zero. Well, this is gonna be the value for alpha. This is gonna be the value for beta. Okay, so what does that mean? This is gonna be one and this is gonna be zero. Okay. So we're identifying, so we're identifying a point in a matrix Again, because this is a matrix, right? This whole thing is a matrix. So we're identifying the one zeroth component in this matrix. And so this essentially is going to be a number that helps us identify which component, oh, the, the interactions between different components. And that's how we're going to be able to visualize or understand at least what these Green's functions are doing. So just as a recap, because this video is going to be relatively shorter than the other ones that, I'm, that I've been posting, I just want to recap again, how, what's our picture looking like? Our picture is looking like we have a field, right? We have our field and our field can be excited at different locations. It can be a Dirac field or it can be a spinner field. Right. And what we do is we convert our field into interacting waves, right? So uh, I don't really, I, I'm not, I can't really think about how I would draw something like that. But the interactions again are, come in the form of interacting waves. So the waves that interact with one another are going to, when we perform a Fourier transform on them, they're are going to give us these two peaks. Okay. If we have three peaks, well, we're going to have uh, we're going to have a Green's function for that. Also, we can have a Green's function for the interaction between these two. And we can have a Green's function for the interaction between these two. And we can have a Green's function for the interaction between these two. Right. And these Green's functions again tell us something about how these interactions take place because the waves are the things that fundamentally interact with one another, not, not the direct peaks. The direct peaks are really just the locations. They give us the locations of the particles. The, the, the Green's functions are, again, what give us the interactions. Because again, waves interact with each other to give localized peaks. That's the, that's the magnificence of the Fourier transform.
And so with that being said, I will see you guys in the next one where we will actually talk about Yukawa interactions. And then later on, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to justify to ourselves why this direct greens function work works. And then later on, we'll talk about um, the last guy, which is the uh, gauge interactions, gauge interactions with um, the Maxwell equation. And we're going to see that that is pretty much the same as uh, the Klein-Gordon case. The Green's function is pretty much the same as the Klein-Gordon case. The only thing we need to take into consideration are two things, right? There's two things. One is that it's massless, right? The gauge interactions we've established before that in, we're, we're talking about a massless case if we want, uh, if we're interested in gauge invariance. And two, the difference between the difference between the Green's function for the spinner field and the Green's function for vector fields, as we're going to talk about with gauge fields, is that spinners have components that don't rely on the space time. Right? Their components essentially they don't rely on the space time, whereas but, but you do have spinners located at each point in space. Whereas the, um, the vectors, the, ga the, the gauge vectors, or the potential four vectors that we're going to be talking about, well, those are functions on space-time. Okay. So that might be a little bit confusing at first. Um, Essentially, essentially, what I'm what I'm going to try to get at when we talk about gauge interactions is that we need to have a Minkowski metric in here instead of um, instead of this. So it's going to be a matrix, right? It's going to be a matrix, but it's not going to be a matrix that looks like this. Uh, it's going to be a Minkowski. So with that being said, I'll see you guys in the next one.